and welcome back to our another episode of Dreams, Passion and Your Hong Kong Story. Today we have with us a very dynamic and successful former Wall Street banker, Mina Martinez, who is now currently on the board for APISF Scholarship Fund. Mina will tell us in detail about the scholarship fund, but this scholarship fund definitely tends to bring up a lot of underprivileged but totally deserving students from Asia Pacific Island Group. Welcome Meena to the show. Thank you Jaya. Meena is a former Wall Street veteran having spent nearly 15 years of her career in various investment banks on Wall Street like Warbus Pincus, Lehman Brothers, Solomon Brothers and Bankers Trust. She is also the founding partner of a mid-sized private equity firm Nugales Partners. Mina has been very actively involved with Asia Pacific Island Scholarship Fund and has been on the board for nearly five years now. She grew up in Japan and in Southern California. So Mina, tell us about uh, your journey in Hong Kong. How long have you been in Hong Kong and what brought you to Hong Kong in the first place? I came to Hong Kong Jaya 10 years ago with my family. I have two children. And we came over as a kind of a typical American expat family, and we've been here for a good 10 years now. So where are you originally from? I spent my adult life in New York City, but I'm originally from Southern California. So Southern California as a child growing up, and uh -huh. then New York City for most of my life, except for the 10 years that I've been here in Hong Kong. All right, Mina, tell us something about your early career days in Hong Kong. Yeah, sure. So when I graduated Wharton with my MBA, that was in 96. Mm -hmm. And this was my first job out of my MBA program. So I came to work for a company called Bankers Trust that's mm -hmm. no longer here. I was a high-yield corporate finance um, associate. Okay. And basically, well, you may not want to hear this, Jaya, but I worked, I worked about 12 hours a day for seven days a week for the first year. For the wow. first 12 months, I dedicated myself to my career, and I said to myself, I'm going to work seven days a week without a break until I learned this job. Whether or not I had actual deals to work on or actual work to do that my boss had given to me, I would come and I would try to learn the business of investment banking. Amazing. I think that has a lot to do with me being female and actually Asian and being female because I didn't want to be perceived as someone who didn't know her job. And then after a year, I was only here for a year, I, I witnessed the handover uh -huh. and then shortly thereafter I moved back to New York and I worked for, at that point, Solomon Brothers in the same capacity, basically, uh, okay. um, in investment banking, same high yield division. But I didn't like it as much. I okay. liked my job here in Hong Kong better. I just had um, people that I was very connected to here in Hong Kong, and my team was very lovely. Right. And, and um, it, it wasn't the same feeling in New York. In New York, it's much bigger. It's probably um, different in that you get exposed to more deals, mm -hmm. but you don't have the same relationships that you would with your bosses and the people okay. that you work under. Okay. So then I moved to what was called the, um, the buy side, okay. which is private equity. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky, lucky enough to get a job at Warburg Pincus okay. as the principal there, okay. which meant that I was in charge of doing investments, okay. making investment decisions. Right. And I absolutely loved that job. Wow. So it was kind of the flip opposite of investment banking. So for me, for the way that my career went, is that you put in your time with investment banking. It's a dynamic, wonderful career um, choice. Yes. But it is very full on. As yeah. The seven days a week, 12 hours a day kind of suggests. Wow. And so on the buy side, for me, it was a much more manageable lifestyle war okay. where I worked five days a week. Okay. Had my weekends to myself. <laughs> okay. But more importantly, I was actually making the investment decisions. Okay. So it was our money that we were putting on the line and we were backing management teams and companies and saying, yes, we like this investment idea. We're going to put $50 million into mm -hmm. your company to build a company with you. And then um, when did you come back to Hong Kong? So I've been here for 10 years, so 2010. And so when you came back, were you still an investment banker? No, I had already given up my investment banking job. I had done it for about 12 years. Okay. And then I stopped doing that and actually worked part-time at a hedge fund for, for a little bit. So you've done it all. Born, <laughs> and it is quite frankly hard to do some of these jobs yes. and being a full-time mommy. You started your career as a banking professional in Hong Kong and then went on to become an investment banker in New York City. Did you notice that there was a difference in style of work? Uh, There's a big difference actually because the flow in New York is just so much larger. 
um, and it's less personal, therefore. So this is, I think a, Hong Kong is a great place to start your career because you do get that more tailored kind of uh, mentorship from your, at my, for me, I was an associate, so my mentor would have been my MD, my managing director. Mm -hmm. And you just get way more hands-on, uh, it, it's almost like an apprenticeship out here when you work with somebody because it's a much smaller group, you're not in a gigantic bullpen like you are in New York, um, and then you just get, you get to build a relationship with your actual colleagues. So less deals in Hong Kong, but way more relationship. New York is way more flow, so you'll learn probably quicker because you're working on more deals, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not about relationship creating at all. So tell me, what motivated you to get into APISF? What yes, was the trigger point? I love point? this question, Jaya. So when I got into Wharton, I was a loan officer for Mitsui Bank, so I had a fancy title, and I ran half the portfolio, the real estate portfolio. Mm -hmm. so myself and, a, and my boss uh, ran the portfolio together. However, I only made about $20,000 a year, and so I was not going to be able to pay for my tuition and room and board at Wharton, which was at the time about $35,000, $40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And because of this, I asked all of my colleagues, all of my bosses, my parents, everybody, nobody could give me a loan to go to Wharton. And at the time, unless you can show that you have the money in your bank account to be able to fund yourself for the first year, they wouldn't accept you. They, you wouldn't be able to go. Wow. So I literally would not have been able to accept the offer from Wharton if I could not show that I had the money. And I didn't have the money. So I ended up asking a lawyer that I worked on one transaction on. Mm -hmm. One meaning I didn't, I didn't know him at all personally. I didn't have a personal relationship with this lawyer. Wow. But he just, 10 second conversation, I said, do you think you could consider co-signing um, this loan for me for $7,500 so that I could go to Wharton? And he just said, sure I will, Mina. Sure I will. Wow. And How so, nice. Yeah, he co-signed this loan for me for $7,500, and that enabled me to go to Wharton. And then from there, you know, my job and my career post-Wharton has been dramatically different. So financially, of course, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. But I literally would not have been able to take that chance and take that opportunity had it not been for the kindness and generosity of this man. But there, who, was this man associated with APISF? Nothing like that at all. No? No association whatsoever. Wow. He was nearly virtually a stranger and he said I believe in you there are good people everywhere there are good people everywhere and I remember at that time I made a mental note to myself that I will pay it forward when I can and this is just the promise that I've made to the universe that wow. the universe allowed me to go and it's my duty to pay it forward and how pay lovely. it forward not just $7,500 worth but in yes, spades because that's course. really how you're going to improve the community that you're from and and support the people who have helped to support you. Tell us about APISF. I think it starts for a, stands for Asia Pacific Island uh, Scholarship Fund. Yes. So what got you started? What got you motivated uh, and excited about APISF? Who are the Asia Pacific Island community people that this scholarship fund tends to? Yes. Well, actually, it's you can kind of think of it as the Asian American mm -hmm. Scholarship Fund. I see. And within Asian American, we also include Pacific Islanders. Okay. And that would be Guam, the American Samoa Islands. I see. So anything that is a U.S. territory um, connected to the U.S., but then also all the Asian Americans yes. that are living in America right now who are basically college students uh -huh. and those who are struggling to meet their financial needs when they do get into a college. So typically our students are very, very high performing, oftentimes valedictorians or at the top of their class. They might get into great colleges, but they simply cannot afford to go I see. to that college uh -huh. uh, because the parent participation piece is too high. Or they might go, but they don't have money to even eat sometimes. So in order to fill that financial gap, um, a partner, my, Lisa Begley and I, started this Asia Pacific Islander Scholarship Fund, the, the Hong Kong chapter here, because we did, first of all, recognize that we ourselves are from that demographic, and we ourselves benefited from scholarship oh, funds is that were given to us um, in, my, in my academic career. And then second of all, there's just many, many Asian Americans here in Hong Kong. Very nice. Did you 
join APISF in Hong Kong? I was actually, I've been with the organization for about 15 years, mm -hmm. strictly as a board member and as a, let's say, supporter. I see. Um, I created the New York chapter about 15 years ago, and I did that for about five years. And then when I moved to Hong Kong, I started up the Hong Kong chapter because of what I said is there's just a lot of Asian Americans here. Right. And there are a lot of corporations that hire a lot of Asian Americans here. So, so I thought it would be a nice synergy. To okay. Starting it, starting it up here. Um, there are a lot of people who have benefited themselves from wow. scholarships who are now head of their groups and head of their firms out here in Hong Kong. So tell me, you have this foundation, you know, you have this uh, fund running here in Hong Kong. And you also have, I think, uh, a group of people who are totally dedicated to you, to this, including you. Do you have a network in place? Like, do you have a system in place which makes sure, you know, once the money comes in for the fund, it reaches the right students? So how do you ensure that? Yes, that's such a great question, Jaya, because oftentimes with scholarship funds and different foundations, you don't really see where the money goes. Yeah. With our scholarship foundation, we have a very close link with our headquarters, which is in Washington, D.C., and we actually get to see and actually get the profiles of and even mentor those students that we fund. So we kind of have a say in who we get to fund in our Hong Kong chapter. And to date, we funded about... Um, 45 students. I see. And so we have our scholars that are coming directly from the Hong Kong Fund. Okay. And they're quite aware that they would not have had this pocket of funds, funding available to them if it had not been the beginning of our chapter, if our chapter had not existed. Okay. So we see where our direct impact is, is taking place. And we get, like I said, the mentoring opportunities. So we get their full academic backgrounds, their history, what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And we also have the ability to pick if we wanted to, let's say they wanted, we wanted them to come from finance or marketing. So if we wanted to select those industries where we could actively mentor, mm -hmm. then we also have the ability to do, that. to do that. So the ability to touch our students and see the impact of our scholarship funds is, is very real. What were some of the challenges that you faced growing up and how did you make your way as an Asian all the way in those days? And it's hard even now, I know, but in those days, to these top Wall Street firms, which are very wide dominated, what would, your, what would be your advice to some of the youngsters who are looking to make a similar journey like yours? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, okay, contrary to what I do now, I very much was part of a stereotype where I was that geeky Asian kid really? who was good at math. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of just focused on my studies because I simply just didn't have a social life back then. I didn't have a lot of friends. I was very intimidated to speak. I didn't speak up in my classes even though I knew the answers. And then I went to college. I went to undergrad at UC Irvine, which is in um, California, County, Irvine, yes. California. And I decided... I really don't want to be this. I don't really want to be this shy person because it's lonely and it's sad. And I have to transform my personality, really, um, in order for me to be happy. Mm -hmm. So I joined a sorority. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I just said to myself, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm going to start to speak up. And I had great friends. I had what's called a pledge group, if you're familiar with sorority life. But you have a yes. pledge group. You have your pledge sisters. Okay. Kappa, Kappa Gamma. Shout uh. out to that. And I still keep in touch with all of my sorority sisters now. But they, because you have this cocoon of lovely girlfriends who kind of supported you, and they were all just as loud and... Vivacious. Really, but yes, and very <laughs> spirited. And so I didn't feel awkward getting right in there and doing all that. Okay. So I spent then my college years doing all the social socializing, I guess, and getting mm -hmm. kind of that out of my system, while also maintaining pr pretty much a straight A grade point average in okay. uh, college. And then, and I focused on economics, that was my major back in undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I worked at a Mitsui Bank. I don't think that bank is around anymore, but it was one of the top Japanese banks. And I became a real estate loan officer. Okay. And I did that for five years. And I think that was a very transformative experience because it's taking my math experience and actually doing business with it. If you kind of look at my background, the way I've spelled it out to you. Yes. Yes, I was a straight A student. Yes, I was you know, valedictorian in my class here and there. 
But I wasn't necessarily number one in college or number one at Wharton. Right. And I think it's because I did focus on getting my A's right. and doing well. Yeah. But I didn't necessarily only focus on those things. Totally. I did focus on the networking. I did focus on other classmates helping me with um, mock interviewing, getting those jobs, doing the networking piece, yes. and creating those softer skill set. That really, when you're in school, is the only time you can do on a risk-free basis, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you go out there and you're working and you're trying to network and you're just practicing, it's, it could be kind of devastating to your career, right? Right, so right. So you take the opportunities that you can when you're in school to do those things. And, yes, it sounds overwhelming to do that and maintain your grades, mm -hmm. but you don't have to be number one. You know, you don't have to get 100% on your test score. Just go for the 95, right. but then move on to these other skills that actually are going to help you even more down yeah. the line. Mm -hmm. So that would be the advice that I would give. So, you know, you've lived in Hong Kong for how many years now, Mina? Ten years. Ten years. How has Hong Kong been for your personal journey? I think from a personal perspective, it's quite dynamic, especially if you're Asian American. Now, for Asian Americans like myself, it is actually a phenomenal place to be, right? Because when you're Asian American in America, you're still quite a minority, right? So okay, yes. not everybody is going to look like you. Right. And not everybody in um, Hollywood, on movie, in movies, TV, commercials, your day-to-day -day influences are not Asian American. Yes. And so you kind of grow up feeling like, oh, do I really fit into this community? Do I not fit into this community? It's your home. Right. But you're not necessarily going to look like everybody else. Yes. Then for me, I went, when I go to Japan, mm -hmm. same is true on the flip side. Yes, they look like me, but yeah. they don't speak like me. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so you are sort of in between there now. <laughs> that's how Asian Americans, I think, have basically live their lives. Yes. Except for in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Totally. Because in Hong Kong, you get to be this oddball, Asian, international, speak many languages, eat many different foods, and totally. there are going to be many people like you here. So for Asian Americans in particular, whether it's Japanese American like myself, or certainly Chinese American, yes, Korean American, anything, you, find, you tend to find a good segment of that pop, those populations here in Hong Kong, and therefore all the foods are here, you can buy groceries um, related to those cultures here. So I think for, for someone who's of that background, it's a phenomenal place to be. Now, are you ready for our rapid fire question round? Sure, Jaya. That's getting to know Mina's Hong Kong story in a bit more fun way. All okay. right. Sounds good. So the first question, what was the last time you did something for the first time in Hong Kong or anywhere? Oh, this is so embarrassing. I've been here 10 years and I just recently hiked Dragon's Back. What? <laughs> Really? Yeah. I would think that you'd hike all the time. No, no, I don't. I'm a kind of a gym rat and I have bad knees. Okay. Those are my two favorite excuses. It is the most beautiful urban hike of the world. That's mm. what they say it. Mm. Mina's favorite casual dining place in Hong Kong. Well, besides the American Club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, American Club. You can say that. I love the food there. Probably Chili Figara. Okay. I also love K Roll. Okay. Um, and, well, definitely Ichiran for ramen for okay. my son. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your favorite formal dining place in Hong Kong? Formal dining is a little trickier, but probably Seva. Mm -hmm. Seva, that, that one dining room with all the flowers in there is just oh, it's quite beautiful. magical. Yes. And I also love Mott 32. Okay. Hong Kong is full of activities for different people. Different kind of cultural activities keeps happening here. Shows and exhibitions keep happening here. I know you are such a vivacious personality. Tell me your most favorite of one of those cultural things or exhibitions that you actually wait for the whole year. Oh, well, definitely Art, um, art Basel. Okay. That whole month of March, which sadly is not going to happen this year, but this, the whole month of March is so vibrant and so dynamic and so international and just so different from what you get to do every day um, with the art, anchored kind of by Art Basel, but the other art expo, all the different Art Asia contemporary show, like all the different art shows that happen here. The people who come to look at art, to collect art, you always, it's a bit of a fashion show because of that. Yeah. 
but then just walking around and seeing all the different pieces and all the different creations. And what's great here is that there is a bit of a focus, it feels like, on Asian art. So you get to see, you know, you hear about Chinese art. Yeah. So you get to see all that kind of side by side by side. And then you get to kind of understand how Chinese art is different from Korean art, which is different from Japanese art. So you don't see that so much in the U.S. when you attend art exhibitions you do, there? You do, you do. But Basel is very uh, special because it does happen in a gigantic convention space and all the galleries are all there in one under one roof okay. which is very unusual because in New York City you have the museums but then outside of that you know to go hopping from gallery to gallery it's time consuming awesome. so your idea of a romantic date in Hong Kong um yeah I don't think I have it's not really my my thing but I would say probably Mont 32 because it's so dark and swanky in there really that's a restaurant it's a restaurant in the okay. bank of uh near bank of China right HSBC building it's a Chinese restaurant right yes it's a Chinese restaurant and they do the best uh duck picking duck here in town okay um that and probably I would say Seba okay. right the outdoor space with all the lights it's very very um gorgeous to be up there as a Hong Konger what are you most proud about Hong Kong? I think I'm, I'm most proud that it has the reputation and it's built itself up mm -hmm. as being a dynamic international place to be, international city. Um, I didn't mention this in my dialogue here, but I actually lived in Hong Kong from 1996 to 97. It was my first investment banking job was here in Hong Kong. Oh. So it predates the handover and it predates IFC and all of those buildings there. And so I've actually gotten to see the transformation of Hong Kong in the 20 years, you know, 25 years uh, since I've been here. And it was a bit of a international kind of a epicenter even back then. Uh -huh. But now it's hands down, no question, the epicenter of activity in Asia. And it's great to have seen it kind of grow up that way. Mm -hmm. It's very welcoming to not just Americans, but, you know, every kind of nationality all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that has created that sense of people can fit in here and belong here and do not just live in a foreign country and, and um, kind of spend your time as an expat here, but really thrive here and really be happy here and really raise your children here. And I think that's a very big difference. I think a lot of other cities, I don't know, name a city, Tokyo, you know, Seoul, they're not as international. It's not yeah, as easy to totally. get around in those I cities. I agree. And so being here in Hong Kong, to be able to speak English, um, yes, you should learn Mandarin or Cantonese, um, <laughs> but you can get by with just learning neither of those and just speaking English. And it's very rare to be able to do that in a city outside of, of, your, own, of yeah, your own home country. I agree. So what would you tell the global business leaders? Why should they engage with Hong Kong? Well, because of what I just said there, um, I think it draws people that are highly educated, highly talented, who come from an international, a worldly background. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, no country can afford to just be about that country. They yes. all have to go international to do well in business, yes. no matter what line of business you're in. Mm -hmm. So this is a great place where you get that exposure, that experience. Um, and you get to deal with, whether it's clients, vendors, whatever, what have you, from all different cultures, that is very valuable experience. And that's valuable experience to a young person, mm -hmm. but it's also very valuable experience to people like us who, you know, someday we'll go back to our home countries and our minds are expanded, right? So we yeah. know how to deal yeah. with different people in different ways. Right. And I think that's valuable experience. And then, of course, for people who run their businesses out here, yes. it's valuable experience, right? Totally. Because you need that international aspect. You need international presence in any business that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And as a business leader, if you're a division head, you certainly need to hire from all different aspects of life. So and you have get all sort of people here with great... And, that, and this is a good cross-section for that. Yes. yes. And what would you tell the 7 billion people around the world? Why should they visit Hong Kong? Because Hong Kong is an easy to access place to visit. Uh, like I said, you can just fly in, take Airport Express. First of all, there are a lot of direct flights to Hong Kong, so mm -hmm. that already kind of says totally. it's a pretty easy place to get mm -hmm. to. The flights might be long, but once you get here, it's rather easy to get around. You can get into any kind of level hotel that, you know, whatever your finances dictate. Um, and then the city, and there's just so much to do between the city, sightseeing, outdoor things, the restaurants, temples you want to visit. Um, historic sites that you want to visit. There's just so much activity to do that you're just not, it kind of is a, 
one solution fits all for all different kind of tourist kind of a place, which again is very unusual because if you go into, again, Tokyo, since I'm familiar with that, you know, you're seeing the city of Tokyo, but really that's it, right? Yeah, so yeah. you can't really do the city of Tokyo and then go visit Mount Fuji so easily. Yes. So it's just a harder way to travel when you travel outside of Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is just basically easy. It's just one island and it kind of has it all here. And so it kind of fits any kind of traveler. Thank you so much, Mina, for being with us. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Jaya. <laughs> Stay tuned for our next episode and where we bring you another fascinating story on dreams, passion, and your Hong Kong story.